Amen. Hey, but we've started a, a series last week uh, called A Better Way. And we go up to part two today. And, and I, I just really believe that this word is for us today. And, and I don't want you just to tune out and go, this is another word. I'm going to just go and do. No, stay focused right now because I believe that God wants to do something in our midst today. Come on, let's be disciplined enough to lean in and to focus our attention on God's Word. Because as we open this Word today, I know that it's going to do something in your spirit. And, um, you know, even as we're in worship just before, I had a word on my heart and I just want to share it. I don't know who it's for, but I just saw some people and it's like their, their life is like a bucket. And their bucket is full. And it just seems like if there's just one more thing that comes into my life, it's just going to cause this... Uh, it's just going to cause a great frustration in my life. And it's almost like you're living life on the edge. Something's just about to tip you over in a bad way. But I just felt in, in worship today just to encourage you with this. Bring your concerns to God. Stop carrying them. You don't need to carry them. He paid a price so that you don't need to carry it. I want to just sort of encourage you. Allow God to go through your life and take out the things that are causing you to live life on the edge in a bad way. Let him search your heart. Let him go through your life. And just maybe there's some things that you're just carrying. There's concerns about your children. There's concerns about a relationship. There's concerns about your finances. You know what? I, I want to just encourage you in this time. Sure, there could be genuine concerns. We've got to focus on things. But don't let it weigh you down. Give it to God and apply God's principles to your life. Because can I tell you something? God has a better way. And he made a better way for us to live here on earth. Let's keep surrendering everything to Him and grabbing hold of all that He has in store for us. So I'm just going to pray before we come to the Word today. I know that was for someone. Grab hold of that. Come on, don't let this push you over the edge. Give it to God and let Him bring a release in your spirit. So let's just pray as we come to the Word today. God, we just thank You for this opportunity that we can gather together. God, we know that we're not here by accident. We're not gathered by accident. We're here gathered under your name and you're going to do something in our midst today, even, even through this screen. Even if we've got small groups gathered together, God, we just pray that you do something in our hearts today, something fresh, something new. God, let your Holy Spirit breathe life into people in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Well, thank you, Mel. Have you got your Bible? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 31. As I said, we kicked off this series last week, A Better Way, and, and we went through the story of the prodigal son, somebody that was blessed but wasted the blessing. You know, I, I, and this whole series is about not wasting the blessings, the things that God's given us. Let's not waste them. Let's be good managers of them so that we can use them to the, to the best and the fullest way possible that God wants us to. So we're not called to waste. We're called to manage what God brings into our life and do it His way. And the scripture we want to, I want to base the rest of this series upon, and I sort of want to focus this series more around relationships, even though the principles we're going to talk about, well, really everything's a relationship and our relationships affect everything because we have a relationship with our, with our service to God. We have a relationship with people. We have a relationship with our jobs. And we're going to make sure that we're, we're good managers of what God's brought into our life so they can be a great blessing. Let's not waste opportunities. Let's not waste the blessings that God brings our way. So 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31. You know, before this verse here, we see that uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians church, addressing an issue about spiritual gifts. Because what it appears like is that they're starting to argue about what the most important gifts are in the church and who's the more important, important people. And Paul's addressing this issue and he's talking about that, hey, that they're all part of the body. They're all important. They're all about serving one another. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, in the message translation, he says this, and yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But then he says this, but now I want to lay out a far better way for you. You know, I think we can be living our life a certain way and I believe if you live in the way that God wants you to live, that's the best way. That's, that's the life that you're called to live. But some of us get caught up in traps and caught up in wrong mindsets. 
And I just pray as we go through this message today that maybe there'll be a jolt in your spirit just to sort of bring alignment. Maybe you're, you're being driven by the wrong thing. Maybe the way that you're going is, is, is driven by pride rather than living in the grace and the humility that God wants us to live in. So Paul's saying, hey, I've got a better way. And we can find ourselves in life as we're going through this journey. We can find ourselves in situations where we're like, man, there must be a better way. And that's what we're going to go through as we go through this story. Because straight after 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it goes into 1 Corinthians 13. And if you've been in church for a while, you know what this scripture is all about. It is the love verse. People read it at their weddings. They, they read it. You know, and, and I just think we've got to understand it's not just limited to a wedding and just talking about love in just, a, in just a romantic way, but it's talking about that we've got to live a life driven by love. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear love and, and my thinking gets, starts to go, yeah, it's like the, the free spirit. It's about living, living a life of love. And, but I don't think, don't, let's not get caught up in the trap of the Hollywood type of things. Let's realize that God is love. And if we've got Jesus in our life, we've got to let the love of God flow through our life. And as we read through 1 Corinthians 13, it describes what love is. And we, we can read that and we can go, man, this is, this is a hard task. I, I don't know how I can do this. But I want to just make it a little bit easier for you today to understand is that what this is explaining, it's explaining Jesus. Now, God is love. And if God is in our life, we should have these attributes coming out of our life. So I'm not telling us to try to work hard at trying to, trying to be all these things that it describes. Let's work hard at letting Jesus flow through our life, which is us surrendering and letting God become greater in our life. Because what does it say in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 7? It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It uh, does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Man, what a powerful verse explaining what love is. That's, who, that's what God is to us. And because we've got God in our life, we've got to let these attributes, the, the, these flow out of our life. And probably for the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is just pick a couple of these attributes and just work out how can we begin to develop this? How can we become less and God become greater in these areas in our life? And the ones I want to talk about for a few moments today is love is patient and kind. Now, we all know how to be kind. We know what kind is. So I don't want to spend too much time on the kind part because we're a kind church. And everyone that's watching, you are kind. Uh, maybe just be very kind and write some encouragement in the chat room right now to preach, to encourage the preacher. But I, I want to spend a little bit of time about patience because I don't know about you, but I seem to struggle with patience in my life. I don't want... God's patience to rise up sometimes. I try to push that down and, and my sinful nature comes over. And I think if we're all honest, we can all struggle with being patient. And I just want to talk and just unpack what the Word of God says and how we can develop patience in our life. Because I really believe that patience, it's foundational to our relational world. If we're not going to exercise and develop this the, the patience in our life, it, it, it's going to affect everything. So let's make sure that we choose to get the foundation right about patience. you know what patience does? I was thinking about this this week. Patience slows our response down for God to show us the right way to respond. And I think if we look at our life and we go to the areas where we weren't patient, it got us into a little bit of trouble. So we've got to exercise. We've got to let God develop patience in our life so we can slow our response Slow our actions down for God to show us the right way to move forward. Because really, patience will affect all of our relationships. And we've got to learn to develop this in our life. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I know, I know the answer to it already. But have you ever felt your patience being tested? I think if we're human, we can all say yes. And even some of you are like, yes, 
even before this service started, my patience has been tested with my kids or with my spouse, whatever it may be. But, you know, I even find in my life when it, even when this whole, I said it last week, when the whole COVID thing happened, you know, we're coming to church, we're trying to learn new ways to do it. There's pressure at church and then going home and kids have been at home all day because there was no school. And I tell you what, my patience was being tested. You know, I even said to myself, you know, what I'm going to do when I get home, I'm going to go and read my Bible, get even extra spiritual so I can handle my kids. And as I'm reading the Bible, and as I'm spending time worship, the kids are coming in and annoying me and I'm getting angry at my kids. I'm like, this isn't working. And really God spoke to me in that time just, and just put on my heart this verse and saying, hey, instead of wasting the blessing, let's be good managers of this time we have with our kids. And I think the best way that we can manage those things in our life is by allowing patience into our life and developing it so we can manage the things in our life better. Because really, I believe there's four things that test our patience. And the first thing is this, is that I believe interruptions test our patience. When we're trying to do something, we've got a plan sorted out, and people are interrupting us, we can react. Interruptions. There's the inconveniences in our life that can begin to test our patience. There's the irritations like when we had that season where Queensland won all those state of origin games, it was an irritation, but now we're living in a time of blessing where New South Wales is winning again and they're going to win this year, I believe. And I believe another thing that tests our patience is inactivity. When things aren't happening as quick as we want them to happen. So there's those four areas that, man, they, they can really begin to test our patience. So we understand that patience, it's foundational to our relationships. It affects everything. We can look at things that begin to test our patience. And I just want to spend us the, the last part of this message on about how do we develop patience. This is practical, so practical. And I really believe as, as a church, the church that we are, we're a practical church. We want to preach the word of God that will affect your Monday that you can apply to your life. And, and I just want to encourage, as I said before, this isn't about pointing to you saying how bad you are. It's about saying, hey, let Jesus shine more out of your life. He has this. This is who he is. And if he's in your life, we can see him flow out. So how do we develop patience? The first is this. Is we've got to accept that, that we have limitations. You've got to accept that you have limits. You can't do it all. You can't do it all. What are some of the limitations we have? We have physical limitations. We have emotional limits. We have mental limits. There's only a certain amount of things we can remember. We have time limits. We only got 24 hours in a day. We have space limits. We can only be in one place at a time. We're not like God where he's everywhere. But we have limits. We have financial limits. I have limits. And you have limits. We've got to be aware of that. We want to develop patience. We can't do it all. That's why we've got to work out what's important and manage those things well in our life. Because if we don't work out our limits, we're going to be running here, there, and everywhere and doing everything average when God's called us to do a few things really well. Work out what you're gifted in. Work out what God has blessed you with, with your relational world, in your work, and begin to manage it well. Focus on what's important. So understand if you want to develop patience, first of all, you've got to understand that you're not Superman, you can't do it all, and that you have limits. Focus on what's important. That's what leads us to the second thing is this. We've got to prune some activities out of our life. We want to develop patience, and you're somebody that's always flying off the handle, always getting angry, always getting frustrated. Maybe you've got too much in your life. It's just like when I started at the beginning, I said I had that word about the bucket. And it's just like you just got too much going on and all it takes is one little thing for you just to flip. You know, I, I want to encourage you, you've got to begin to prune some activity. Maybe you've got a habit in your life where you hold things instead of giving it to God. Come and begin to let God do a work in your life. So you've got to understand there's some stuff that needs to go. We like to hold on to certain things. See, I, I found in life that every season of my life I had to let go of something to grab onto something better. Let me give you an example of this. When I got married, I wasn't a single person anymore. I could just go out and just spend all the time with everybody else. No, I had a wife that I needed to manage well. 
And when I say manager, I'm not trying to say it in a derogatory way. I'm saying I had something that was blessed. God blessed me with, and I had to look after that and develop it. So I had to say no to some things so that I could cultivate the blessing in my life. You know, then I got married. Then I had kids. I only got used to being married and, and spending a lot of time with my wife. Never got kids. And it's sort of like now I sort of can't do all the things that I want to do. I now have to look after them. And so I had to let go of some things, some some activities, so that I could grab hold of the new blessing that God brought my way. And we've got to understand there's always things. Sure, they may not have been bad, but that season is over, and now you've got to prune some activity so that you can create margin in your life. But what am I, I'm not saying get rid of all the fun stuff. I think some of you guys need to have a bit more fun. And I think some people are just taking life way too seriously. And I think we've got to understand that, man, God has called us to live life and life to the full. Come on, the God that we serve, he's one that's, that, that's uh, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Come on, he's all about having fun. So don't just cut out all the fun, but cut out, prune those activities that are taking you away from what's important. The third is this, allow time. This is developing patience. Allow time for the unexpected. Allow time for the unexpected. This is super practical. Now, if you've got to be somewhere and you need to, and you realize that, hey, it's going to take 15 minutes to get there in no traffic and it's going to take, you know, 30 minutes in traffic, allow margin so you're not stressing yourself out. There could possibly be traffic. So bring margin into your life. There can be, you know, we can plan, plans are good, but we all know that plans don't always go to plan. They don't always work. So allow time for the unexpected. If you've got to be somewhere, allow more time. Realize you could have a flat tire. If you're anything like me, it takes you 15 minutes to find your keys. So allow more time so that you're not rushing yourself. So you don't have to, um, you know, so you can develop patience that way. Allow time for the unexpected. Stop cutting things so fine and putting all that pressure on yourself. The fourth is this. Put down time in your schedule. Man, we can get so busy doing nothing. We can think we're so important and we're working, 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 working. Can I encourage you, put downtime in your schedule. Put some things that are going to emotionally recharge you into your schedule because you're just going to burn yourself out and you're going to burn all those other people around you because you're so driven. Come on, let's put downtime. For some people, that's a scary thing. How can I put downtime? I don't know how to even, what downtime even is. You know what? If you don't learn to have downtime, you're not going to last. Jesus set us that example. He always went to an isolated place, prayed, had downtime. Even in the midst of all the chaos, he would pull himself away and have downtime. Come on, let's schedule downtime in our life so that we can replenish ourselves, so that we can begin to um, serve God in a greater way. Put down time in your schedule. I've got two more of these. Maybe three more. The fifth, how we can develop patience, is make allowances for each, make allowances for each other. Make allowances for each other. Sometimes we, we, we can be so judgmental and we can judge people and we can say they should know better and we can get all this um, aggression towards people because they've made a mistake. But what does it say in Ephesians 4 verse 2? Be patient with each other. I, just, I can see what's going on right now. There's some spouses nudging each other right there. Be patient with each other. Make allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Now, if we want to develop patience, we've got, to allow, we've got to make allowances for people that, hey, they're going to get it wrong. They're going to do things the way that we don't want them to do sometimes. But you've got to understand, too, that we all have bad days. If you get me on a bad day, you'd be quite alarmed, just like if I got you on a bad day. We all have bad days, and we've got to make allowances for each other's faults, for, that, for the areas of their life. We don't understand the backstory of, of why they're doing what they do. You know, what we do many times is that we will judge people by our standards. Oh, I wouldn't have done that. Why are they doing it for? And we can start to say, why isn't everybody like me? I thank God everybody's not like you or like me. 
That's the beauty of the body of Christ. We're all different. And we've got to realize everyone has different, different capacities, different gifts, different skills. And we want to be able to help people to become better at what God's placed in their life. But let's stop comparing ourselves to others and make allowances for others, realizing that we don't know the whole story. We don't know what's taken place. Let's be quick and slow. You might go, what do you mean? Well, let's be quick to listen and slow to speak when we see what's going on. Instead of just calling it and, and, and judging it, let's listen and be slow to speak and just see what's going on in people's lives. Because you realize they could be just having a bad day. But you know what? Us as well as believers, we understand we're called to encourage each other to righteousness, to, to good deeds, to love. So let's make sure we're encouraging each other to do that, to love and, for, and, to, and to do good deeds to those around us. Number six, we've got to laugh. If you want to develop patience, you've got to learn to laugh. What does it say? Proverbs 14 verse 30, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. Now having a sense of humour, laughing, I believe will cause you to live a longer life. What does laughing do? It releases tension in our life. I really believe what laughter is as well is it's the antidote to anxiety. Many of us are getting so anxious, but keeping getting so serious. Come, let's just laugh a little bit more. Get around people that you can laugh with, share, share stories with, and, and have a good time. See, most of us, as I said before, take ourselves way too seriously in a bad way. I, I've written this down today. I'm, I'm making this the motto of my life. We need to learn to find fun in the frustration. When the things aren't going to plan, when, when the areas of our life are, aren't, aren't going as quick as we want them to, to grow and to move, let's learn to have fun in the frustration. Let's learn to laugh, relax, trusting that God is at work and He's going to make it all work out in the end as we keep loving Him and following the path that He has for us. Laugh. Number seven, and we're going to bring it to a close right now, is this. How do we develop patience? Stay connected to God. What does it say in John 15, verse 4 and 5? Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is that scripture saying? That if we want to bear the fruit, good fruit, it's about remaining in God and God in us. See, there's two important things we can take out of staying connected to God that will help us develop strength and courage. And the first is this. Patience, it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. If we have God in our life, patience is a fruit of that. We're going to stay connected to God so that these, His patience can, can help us. Because I think we're trying to do it in our own sometimes, but realize we've got the Spirit of God in us. Come, we're going to say less of me and more of you, God. I trust in you. See, a branch on a tree has no choice but to produce the fruit. But a branch disconnected on the ground has no choice, has no chance. Okay, we want to have patience flowing, about staying connected so He can flow through us. If we disconnect ourselves from God, we've got no chance of bearing that fruit. And the second is this, about staying connected to God, is this staying connected to God reminds us of God's patience towards us. Man, we're, we're rebels. We get caught up in doing it our own way. But God is patient towards us. He is loving. He is gracious. And I just think as we can understand how patient He is with us to do things the right way, let that flow out of our life. And let's let God's Spirit flow through us, knowing that He is patient with us. Let's be patient with those around us. You know, I, I just know today that that was helpful for people. And as I was studying this, even in my own life, I was like, man, there's some areas that, man, my, my, my sinful nature tries to swing me a certain way, but I've got to bring it back to God's way. God's way is the better way. Letting His kindness and patience flow through our life 
so that we can be good managers of what God has given us. You know what? On the topic of staying connected to God, maybe there's some people that are watching today and you haven't got a relationship with God. And you can't say, well, this, this fruit of the Spirit can flow through me because you're not connected to God. See, Jesus came and died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, our wrongdoings, so that we can have a relationship with God. See, some people think that this Christian walk, it's all about do's and don'ts and it's, it's, it's religious. I like to look at it this way. It's a relationship. And we can have a relationship with a mighty God and, and He comes into our life and He does a work from the inside out. He begins to change us from the inside out because in our human thinking, we think, no, I've got to change for me to be accepted. But God's saying, no, come as you are and let me do a work from the inside out. I don't know, maybe you're struggling with patience in your life. And maybe it's because you don't have a relationship with God. Come, God wants to show you there's a better way. You know, you once could have had a relationship with God, but you walked away. Come on, we've got a loving father. Just like the prodigal son, his father was waiting there with open arms for him to come back. See, we've got a God that, He's the God of the, the second, third, fourth, fifth chance. Don't ever think that you can't come back to God. You can come back to God. He is waiting with loving arms. Come on, He paid a price for you and for me. So if that's you here today, you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you're coming back, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now because we are saved by our confession. We are saved by the belief in our heart. You know, we believe in Jesus. We believe that He's the Son of God. We believe that He died and rose again. And it's through our faith, our belief in that, that we have right standing with God, that we are saved. And I want to lead you in a prayer about putting your faith in God today. So if that's you, and you want to come into relationship with Him, come on, don't put it off tomorrow, till tomorrow. Today's the day of salvation. Let's say this prayer together. It goes like this. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I believe that he rose again. I confess that I'm a sinner and I repent of that. Jesus, come into my life. Wash me clean. Be my Lord and Savior in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. If you made that decision today, that is the best decision you could ever make. Now, we want to help you um, in, in your next step. On the screen, there's going to be a phone number. You can just text, um, text that number. Say yes to that number. And we want to get in contact with you and send you a Bible. Or in the chat room, there's a raised hand button. Push that. Then push the request prayer button. We've got people that just want to be able just to talk to you and help you in your next step. Give you a Bible. Don't just make this decision and just walk no let us help you because I know that this decision that you've made today it's it's one that the devil wants to come and try to take away but if you can get connected into church around faithful people we can help you to begin to stay on the path that God has for you it's a much better way than doing it your own way amen amen well I'm excited about the rest of this series we've got two more weeks of it as we keep unpacking you know, the better way, the life that's driven by love. And today I just know that patience for all of us, we always get tested in that. But I just want to encourage you, keep pressing into God. Keep letting the, the sinful nature go and let God rise up so that you can let that fruit of the Spirit become more evident and help you in this life that God has. But thanks, church. Bless you. And let's keep inspiring people to live for Jesus.